Hello everybody, my name is Maciek Zakrowski. I'm a journalist. I'm used to work for 30 years in public media. Currently I'm a freelancer. Some regular uh, radio programs in a prestigious radio station in Poland. And we are going to start our uh, citizen dialogue. Just to remind you, citizens dialogues are public debates with European commissioners and other decision makers such as member of the European Parliament, national, regional and local politicians. It has a long tradition. Uh, the first citizen dialogue uh, took place in the Spanish city of Cadiz. It was 27th of September uh, uh, 2012. And then the Vice President Vivian Redding met with the local community to talk about Europe. The events take the form of a questions and answers session. Fortunately, time has changed a lot in the form of dialogues. We are not able to meet with citizens and talk face to face. Thanks to modern technology, we can talk online. And even if we are not fully satisfied, of course, it's better to continue in that way than to cancel. Uh, today, our dialogue is about future of work mobility in the European Union. I have a pleasure to introduce our speakers and the our panelists, Magdalena Svekle, Councillor at the Labour Law Department, Ministry of Economic Development and Technology. Hello. Hello, good afternoon. And with us is also Mr. Jordi Kuril, Director of Labour Mobility at DG Employment European Commission. Good afternoon. Hi, my, my pleasure to be here. It's also our pleasure that we have such a distinguished guest. Uh, our friends from Labour Mobility Initiative Association, uh, they are cooperating us in that project. We're gathering for over last day's questions to our guests from representatives of trade unions, employers, organizations. Expected too many. <laughs> so at the end, I have a list of questions which are a compilation of many questions, but I hope we will fulfill almost all expectations of you, citizens. Uh, being a journalist and uh, reading different texts now, a topic I see a little chaos in terms my colleagues use. Sometimes they write about cross-border workers, sometimes mobile workers. Writing about posted workers, they include that group lorry drivers. Can these terms be used interchangeably or do they refer to different types of workers? We explained it to be sure that we are using the correct glossary in our dialogue. Who is going to start? Is first, maybe. Me. As you wish, uh, if you want. Okay, excellent. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for raising that topic, actually, because um, I've been working for, for uh, dealing with labor mobility for like um, the 16, 20, 20 years, actually, now. And uh, what I... Um, uh, observe is that um, although in the EU context, uh, free movement of workers, posting of workers with, uh, in framework to provide services, cross-border workers or commuter, commuting workers are um, covered by the term labour mobility, it's often um, mixed and um, and equated in, in public uh, debate, although from the legal point of view, I'm a lawyer, sorry, I must raise it. Um, the treaty differ differentiates uh, four freedoms, uh, while three of them, um, free movement of uh, workers, uh, freedom to provide services and freedom to establishment may be related to the term uh, labor mobility. So um, I think this is one of the problems that um, sometimes people dealing with different subjects use the same or similar term for a bit different um, actually context. And uh, that may raise um, mm, difficulties, especially if we look, for example, uh, uh, from the uh, posting of workers point of view, um, if we look on the directives uh, concerning uh, posting of workers and regulation and coordination of social uh, security uh, systems. Uh, the question whether it, whether it could be actually uh, uh, clarified, well, 
um, there are different regimes, so there are certain definitions that need to be applied in certain regimes, and that makes it uh, difficult. So we, what we should do, I think, is to try to to clarify in every time when we speak what we speak about. What is the scope? What do you think, Ronti? But just to make the easy more complicated. To and, and 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 going to to Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Kurel uh, from the labor law perspective, excluding the discussion of social security, what is the difference between business trips and posting of workers? Well, this, uh, there is a difference uh, which legally can be explained. The the issue is uh, as I was uh, said before. Uh, is that uh, one thing is the discussion amongst the experts and uh, fine lawyers as uh, she is, and another thing is the discussion in the public perception. Now, there is a difference, and I hope that uh, we would agree on that, between uh, posted workers and business trips. Uh, both uh, are supposed to be, uh, or both can be of short duration, so that's the uh, first point. The second uh, thing that's important is that in both cases, if you're talking about uh, workers, about uh, uh, is that uh, the, uh, the employer remains in one member state and the actual business trip or the actual posting takes place in another member state so there is a, a cross-border element uh, in these in these uh, in these both terms now the difference is that uh, in one the business trips there is no service which is uh, furnished by uh, uh, neither by the person by the worker nor by the employer to whom this person has to report. For instance, that can be uh, a training activity, it can be a, a participation to a fair, etc., etc. So it can, that's that's one uh, one um, of the possibilities. The other is when it is a short-term uh, activity in another member state, but there is a provision of services. Right? For instance, if uh, let's say that uh, a company, a Spanish company, has installed. I don't know, let's say a heating or a kitchen in a, in a French house, and it has taken them, I don't know, 10 days to organize that. Uh, this is posting. If after a month uh, this kitchen uh, is not working anymore, and a worker has to be sent to repair the kitchen within uh, 24 hours, and it's just go crossing the border doing providing this service of repairing and then coming back, this is not a business trip. This is a provision of services, and therefore, this is a, a, a situation of posting. So, explained like that can seem more or less simple. I'm afraid that all the lawyers uh, who are around this table could start finding situations where it would be difficult to distinguish, not to talk about non-lawyers, where sometimes the difference is not evident. But in the underlying that, there is a clear difference, and the clear difference is whether there is a service which is provided or not. I will add okay. also, if I may, one sentence. Just one, please. Yeah, uh, what 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 this ma what makes it even more difficult is that uh, there is no um, concept of business trip uh, provided in the EU by the EU law. So um, it actually depends on the uh, national legislation whether. Um, whether to regulate and how to regulate business uh, trip. So, um, uh, in the context of the new directive for concerning posting of workers, there are some additional um, provisions on that, so clarifying when uh, and which law and which regime applies uh, in certain situations. Is that uh, there is no positive uh, definition, I fully agree with you, but uh, the posting of workers directive says that it applies only in those cases where there is a provision of services. So, a contrario, I guess, that we could find the definition there. Yeah, international law. <laughs> okay, so yeah. now we have more or less more knowledge about the terms we are using. But the, the, the very last, I, I think, general question, if, if you allow me, uh, I pass it to, to Mr. Jordi Curell. All for economic freedoms. Why is free movement of services, including the mobility of workers, so problematic and 
Persia. Will the revised directive bring an end to those controversies in your opinion yeah. or not? Thank you for that. But I think that the, there is an underlying assumption uh, which I don't fully share. I mean, it's as if there was only a problem with uh, this freedom and not with the others, with the freedom of, uh, of uh, movement of goods or of capital, or sort of workers. And I think that there are some underlying problems there as well. So that's my first nuance. My second nuance is that there are problems, but there are also many solutions. So we think that, of course, in this dialogue, we are looking at the problems, but I think that the fact, I mean, and companies who are, which are established outside of the European Union, uh, for instance, if we think about Brexit now, the, com the British companies will have an issue now with, uh, with providing services into the European Union. Eh? So I think that it is important that we, uh, that we analyze the problems, but without forgetting that there are many solutions as well. Now, why are there problems? Because there is a tension between, uh, between uh, the freedom to provide services, which is one of the fundamental freedoms, as we have said, and uh, the application of labor law. So in principle, the labor law that should apply to a worker working in one state is the labor law of that state, of that country. And that's what happens when a worker decides to move uh, on a permanent basis to another uh, to another member state. Uh, the law that applies is no longer the law from the country where he comes from, but for, uh, in the country where uh, he or she works. So that's so there is a tension between that. If we had uh, a situation where the labor law of the country where the service is provided would apply, that would be very problematic because that would be uh, a real uh, hindrance to, uh, to the free provision of services. So what the legislator has come up with back in 96, and this was based on, uh, on uh, judgments by the European Court of Justice, is to try to find a balance. To say, on the one hand, we let those workers who will be there on a temporary basis to be covered by the law of the member state of origin, and therefore it's easier for the company, but there is a bulk of uh, public order or public, uh, public law <coughs> uh, the provisions of the uh, labor law of the home member state which should apply. And then, of course, like every time that we are talking about uh, striking the right balance, and there's discussion about that. I mean, what could be the right balance for you could not be the right balance for me. So there is a margin for discussion. But I think that on the principle that we should combine, on the one hand, adding no hindrances, no hindrances to the provision of services, yet at the same time protect the basic rights of the workers, I think that on that we agree. Now, have we struck the right balance or not? I think that you will find as many opinions as European citizens who you have in Europe. Some will say that, uh, there's, that there is too much uh, emphasis on the free provision of services to the detriment of the protection of the rights of the workers. Some others will say, on the contrary, that uh, the workers are no longer protected. We're giving much leeway for the freedom uh, to provide services. So I guess that it is a classical European debate. I'm afraid it's not over, but I think that the recent uh, directive and, uh, that was adopted a couple of years ago and the directive from 2014, which is the enforcement directive, have brought, I mean, there were passionate debates about it, but I think that they have brought some peace about uh, a common understanding on where the right balance lies. Mm -hmm. yeah, I found on the list uh, the interesting question, which is, let's say, uh, kind of supplement to what was said, uh, and maybe I will pass it to to uh, uh, Ms. Magdalena Sheckley. Member states have developed specializations in their economic activities, gaining comparative advantage in some sectors. For instance, good wine associated with France, Italy, and Spain. cheese and tulips with Netherlands. Uh, and now I'm going further. But when you need a group workers, you call Poland, Slovenia, Croatia or Bulgaria. Despite the fact that customers are happy, skilled posted workers in France, for instance, are legally associated with undeclared work, via the title of the slavery law implementing the enforcement directive or with unfair competition. Why is like that? Well, um, I must start with um the statement, let's say, that um, we should not uh, compare um, and put in the same place um, goods like cars or, or um, 
um, or chocolates and and people, yeah. So, um, but um, yes, indeed, we have um, again um, really uh, strong, solid positions as regard. Um, um, the country from uh, which uh, posted workers are in the biggest in in number, uh, especially in construction or in, um, in in transport. So um, that is the um, uh, the main. Um, um, I think it should. Why? Why we? Um, why we are so? Uh, as, as in, in certain, certain cases, uh, considered to be uh, the place where we have bold, uh, but also um, very good workers and um, uh, who are flexible and who are dedicated uh, to uh, to work. So, um, but actually, uh, if we look at the uh, num at the mobility, uh, Poland is not the main, uh, the, the most mobile uh, country. Let's say uh, there are others that are much more um, developed in that. If we compare, not absolute terms, but relative, uh, relative uh, terms. Mm, so, as regards um, mm, your question, uh, why it causes uh, mm, problems, I think uh, I would totally agree with what was previously said said by Jordi that this is the two, um, let's say, values that should be compared and that. It's, it's hard to find uh, balance sometimes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next question on my list uh, to Mr. Jordi Kurel, maybe, where is the line between freedom to provide services and freedom of establishment? Uh, it is necessary to register a company in every member state in which a company post workers. Will the registration of the company be compulsory after 12 or 18 months of posting? Uh, we are moving away from uh, from the issue of labor mobility, and now we are really talking about uh, about this double freedom of establishment and of provision of services, which is of course related to mobility, but which goes beyond. I think that uh, at the core of your question is the issue of the 12 and 18 months, eh? uh, and this indeed was one of the questions which was very hotly debated when uh, during the discussions on the adoption of the revised directive. I mean, by definition, uh, so just a couple of, of underlying statements, I would say. By definition, posting is temporary, by definition, because if it's permanent, it's no longer a posting, it is uh, someone who decides to uh, change domicile and work in another member state. So that's, that's the first point. Now, it's not because it's temporary, not last for, two, three, four, five years. I mean, if we think, for instance, Madrena was uh, referring before to the construction sector, to the building sector, some of the public works uh, are uh, last for three, four, five years. So again, it, it is temporary by definition, posting, but uh, the fact that it's temporary does not mean that you can put an a priori link. But uh, that, um, as we said, it can apply. Uh, a work can be posted for four or five years. Now, what this directive uh, proposes uh, or establishes the, the, the amended directive is not that posting should become permanent, but that the rules change. Yeah? So, for the first twelve months, which which can be prolonged until eighteen months, uh, the labour law of the country of origin applies, except the uh, the core. Uh, provisions of uh, public order uh, of the member state of uh, of the host member state. Okay, so that's the, the general regime. Now, what this directive establishes is that uh, after 12 or 18 months, uh, if the if the posting is still uh, going on, then it, uh, the full uh, application of the labor of the host member state. 
And why is that? Uh, the explanation uh, for that is uh, pretty simple. I mean, why why this principle of, I mean, we all know when we said it in the beginning that the principle is the application of uh, the Lex Lossi Laboris, uh, which means uh, very, very simply, it means that uh, the labor law that should apply to the employment contract, it's the labor law uh, of, the, of the place where the work is carried out. Now, we have an exception for posting, as we said, in order to facilitate free provision of services. Now, uh, the, uh, the underlying assumption of the revised directive is that after 12 slash 18 months, the link of the worker with the, uh, with the labor market of the host country is so, uh, is so close that he or she should move uh, under uh, the labor law of this country. Again, this was a discussion. I guess that it can be it can be debated, no doubt, and it is debated. Uh, people, some people find it's too long, uh, this period. Some other people find it it's too short. Some other people think that uh, the labor law of the sending uh, member states should be applied uh, forever. So it is a, a discussion. But at some point, the legislator, uh, which is at the end of the day, uh, the governments of the EU, which represent their citizens, plus the European Parliament, which of course represents all the citizens in the European Union, they decided for this, uh, for this balance. I mean, uh, I think, of course, as a, as a Commission official, I think that this balance is the right balance. Now, I accept perfectly well that other, uh, other citizens in Europe can have different views, but uh, that this is a very, uh, a very uh, conscious decision that was taken by the legislator, and I would like to remind that, as I said before, the legislator, when we're speaking about the EU legislator, is represented both by national governments and by the European Parliament, where uh, the sovereignty of the European Union lies, but it's also about government. Uh, Mrs. Magdalena Svetli, do you want to add something to that point, or we can move forward? I think we can move forward. It was covered quite uh, wisely. <laughs> wisely, not quite. Yeah. <laughs> sure. So, so let's move to the to another, let's say, sensitive issue. Uh, the workers and the trade unions expressed today, also the Polish trade unions, I would underline, uh, the disappointment about the fact that the revised directive does not provide equal pay for the same work in the same place. They were demanding that for uh, four years. And, and here the term re remuneration is approaching. Would you explain what does remuneration mean in the revised directive? I guess the question is for me or ah, for okay. Madalena. I'm happy with Madalena. Eh? Oh. Ah. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay, so I start. <laughs> I can say, say. well, uh, indeed, um, uh, uh, there is quite change uh, recently. Uh, the new directive, the revised uh, um, Posting of Workers Directive, actually provides uh, for change in, uh, in terms of remuneration for posted workers. Uh, by replacing the, uh, repla replacing the um, former now rule of um, to ensure minimum uh, uh, rates of pay for such workers, for posted workers. Um, and now the requirement since uh, 13, uh, 30, uh, July 30, 2020 uh, is to ensure full, full remuneration of the host country, including all mandat uh, mandatory uh, elements. What is um, worth to notice is that when we compare the um, remuneration paid to posted worker and remuneration due to the law of the host uh, of member state, the gross uh, remuneration uh, should be taken into account rather than individual elements. It is a complicated issue. Um, the practical guide uh, on posting that was uh, recently, well, last year in September, if I remember correctly, published by the European Commission, gives um, an example uh, of remuneration elements, for example, in, in Austria, in construction. Uh, there were wages, uh, th their wages include uh, overtime rates, night uh, allowance, uh, Sunday public holidays allowance, etc. etc. 
also um, all the um, bonuses that are related to dirty, heavy or dangerous work if it applies in certain uh, situation. Another change in, in the new directive is um, that the temporary worker, agency workers, um, uh, refers to temporary agency workers, the temporary uh, employment undertaking or placement agency who um, is obliged to, to guarantee posted workers uh, with the same pay uh, as for the local temporary uh, worker. Mm, I must say that uh, in our opinion, uh, the new provision concerning remuneration is a bit controversial too. Um, Poland in 2018 uh, brought a complaint to Court of Justice uh, of the European Union against the provision of the new directive concerning uh, the duty to uh, guarantee the posted uh, of workers uh, to, to, to the posted workers remuneration of the host uh, member state. Mm. According to the complaint, the, the challenge uh, provisions lead to legal uncertainty as regards to amount uh, of remuneration that is actually sh should to be to be paid to to faucet of workers. These, on the one hand, constitute um, excessive burden to to employer posting workers. Um, Require, because it requires from him to to keep up with the with the all elements in different countries um, and to um, examine all the uh, regulations in different in in the country you know, where he operates temporarily. Uh, on the other hand, it also uh, lead to um, unequal treatment of employer. Um, of the employees uh, comparing to the domestic uh, employers. So it is, um, it has been changed, it, and in a sense, uh, the rule has been changed. Um, there are many uh, uncertainties. Uh, we had the law, uh, the ECJ judgment from. Um, 2007, I believe, uh, the Lavalon Partner Judgment that describes um, that so-called penny supplement, supplement or special construction allowance intended to finance uh, different social security insurance was not a minimum fee. Uh, and at that time, uh, the Court of Justice rules that it is in, incompatible with uh, the directive on posting of workers without considering whether it is justice or justified or proportionate. It seems, however, that according to the new um, provisions um, of amended, uh, amending, amended by the revision directive, um, the service provider would be obliged uh, to pay posted workers the equ equivalent for this type uh, too. Um, that would definitely require from, um, from the member states to provide clear information uh, what is actually needed and uh, according to the, the, the national law and from uh, employers to, um, to check every time uh, when it's uh, which law applies and what are uh, the required uh, amount of remuneration. I just wanted to ask you because we now have a limit of time um, uh, about the new issue, but it, it's it's let's say linked to the previous one. The question is about the labor mobility in the EU, uh, European Union, which is growing, we know very well, and what do you expect from the new rules on coordination of social security systems will, uh, will be tailored, yeah. and, and it could also, in your opinion, complicate the situation, what what necessary not, not to have this, let's say, side effect? Uh, 
this coordination of social okay. security system? Thank you, for, thank you for that question because I think it's uh, indeed very relevant. If I may, just uh, two minutes, um, even less than that, to react to Magdalena's uh, point, which of course, as usual with her, is very precise and very uh, very right. Eh? So I'm not contesting the analysis. Eh? Indeed, uh, there's been a change. Uh, we have moved from minimum wage to uh, to uh, mandatory elements of remuneration. This is considered for some people as not enough. You mentioned that yourself uh, uh, when you said that trade unions are not happy. This is considered to be uh, too much for other parties. Fine. This is considered to be complicated. That's why uh, there is uh, an obligation in the enforcement directive to provide better information. This is why the European Labour Authority that Magdalena knows uh, very well as well will be helping with uh, with all of that yes. and indeed what's good about uh, about uh, this new uh, well, this new uh, directive I mean, what's good about living in a, uh, being member of the european union where uh, where uh, the rule of law uh, applies is that uh, if a member state is not in agreement with the decision taken by the legislator very naturally can go to the European Court, and on the 8th of December, we will see what the European Court decides. And if uh, if the legislator got it wrong, we have to amend it. If the legislator if the legislator got it right, then of course uh, the countries, the two member states which have brought it to the court, will just abide by the ruling. So I think that this is the normal way of uh, of going about uh, different views. Now it's very interesting what you say about uh, the social security regulations because uh, Madena said in the beginning that uh, that there are. Those are regulations which apply to the same situation, but which have different concepts, and that can make life a bit complicated. If I may start by saying that social security is always complicated. Um, I shouldn't say that, but it is the truth. I mean, if, we, if you go uh, just as a Polish citizen, I guess, if you uh, change uh, from being a self-employed uh, and then be, you become a, uh, a worker, or then et cetera, et cetera, you will have to change regime and it is always complicated. Imagine if the, this complication which exists in uh, 27 member states, you try to coordinate it. It gets even more complicated. I know that this this uh, does not help those who experiment the difficulties. But again, I would like to underline here uh, that there are issues, that there are difficulties, but there are advantages. Thanks to these rules, complicated, okay, but thanks to these rules, a person which has had, uh, which has worked in different member states can accumulate all the periods uh, of, uh, of cotization in order to build his or her rights to a pension. Yeah. Imagine there was no coordination. It would mean that the Polish worker who would have worked 10 years in Poland, 10 years in France and 10 years in Slovakia uh, would not qualify for a pension in any of these three member states. Now, thanks to that, this worker will have recognized 30 years of cotization. So I think that, again, said like that, it sounds very simple. Magdalena knows better than I do that then when it comes to the application to the individual case, the calculations are complicated, etc. But the, the principle is there and I think that this is uh, this is fundamental. And this exists already uh, since uh, 57, so it's, it's not something new. Huh? I mean, we like saying, uh, those of us who work in this sector, we like saying that the third regulation which was adopted after the creation of uh, what at the time was the European Community is the regulation of social security on the condition of social security which is so it means that it is something which dates from quite a long uh, quite a long time now precisely because this uh, regulation aims at coordinating and not at harmonizing it has to be adapted and uh, renovated every so often because the national systems change and if, if I just take an example, I mean, 15 years ago, uh, all the issues related, related to uh, care and uh, long-term uh, health issues related to long-term care did not exist with the same equity that, that they exist today. So we have to update and to modernize uh, our regulation. And that's what we have proposed. Unhappily, uh, there's still not an agreement uh, between uh, the co-legislators. Parliament and Council have not yet agreed uh, to our proposal, and there are some issues which are being discussed, which is a bit of a pity, but I mean, those are things that, that happen, so uh, that's, that's what it is. But the bulk of the rules which allow for uh, workers and self-employed and citizens, uh, a very simple example, I mean, a Spanish person which goes to uh, Poland, uh, if this person is insured in Spain and this person falls sick in Poland, she will be treated by the Polish system, who will then bill all the costs to the Spanish uh, regime. I mean, this is something which 
all of us who have uh, traveled abroad outside of the European Union, I mean, this is a major advantage. So what I mean by that, I guess, is that notwithstanding the complication, notwithstanding the fact that uh, this uh, moder last modernization that we proposed uh, four years ago has yet not been yet adopted, I think that we do still have a bulk of provisions which facilitate enormously uh, the mobility within, uh, within the European Union. Um, I am sorry I am not allowing you to interact too much, but the time is running and there is still a lot of questions, I think, important. The, the question about the uh, current situation, uh, which worries uh, everybody in, in the world, Europe as well, the pandemic questions are okay. Have the pandemic uh, uh, the driven restrictions on mobility shown that posted workers are redundant or needed or than ever? I would say yes, the pandemic has clearly demonstrated uh, new challenges faced by, by uh, posted workers and employers and highlighted uh, some situations. Um, however, we don't have, uh, we do not have yet any available data on how the out of the break of, of uh, COVID um, has and will affect uh, posting uh, within the internal market. If we look at the um, PDA uh, uh, A1, which is Portable Document uh, A1 issued for um, posted workers, if we look on, on numbers posted in Poland, according to uh, Article 12 of Regulation 883, uh, one might take the um, the expression, the impression that um, there is some degrees, uh, certain degrees in in posting. Um, however, it should be uh, noted that during the log uh, lockdown uh, period, the standstill principle was adopted, which means uh, no uh, changes were made to um, the termination of applicable legislation due to the change of um, of what um, work model uh, forced by COVID. Um, if we look at the numbers. Um, of workers posted to Poland, uh, it used to be insignificant even before pan pandemic, um, and still um, in 2020 we haven't noticed uh, much differences in that respect. Uh, but when I ask the colleagues from National uh, Labour Inspectorate who are dealing with um, all the questions concerning posters of workers in Poland, uh, as uh, it is required by the by the direct directive, uh, whether they had any specific questions concerning a posting of workers during during the dynamic, then. They said, of course, they had questions concerning um, possibility of uh, ent enter the, the territory, the closing borders, uh, the need uh, to quarantine. But also, what is interesting, um, a lot of questions concerning performing performing remote con uh, work during the posting uh, period in Poland. So um, it is seen that. Um, during the pandemic period, like all other workers, like we, uh, as a mode of uh, communication and and actually work, um, also um, in in cases where it is possible, uh, they adapted and um, and mm, try to um, mm, adapt to the situation. So um, I don't think it's uh, at least for now. Um, any visible changes. Posting, uh, posted workers are, uh, make an important uh, contribution to the internal market in various sectors of EU economy and continue to do so uh, during the pandemic. What is important from my, our perspective, from, from a national administration perspective, but I think, I hope also from the European Commission is to provide them with adequate uh, information with protection and decent uh, working and living conditions. Sometimes we did have alarming uh, information about um, the situation. So uh, the, this situation uh, had be, have to be monitored uh, closely.
Okay. Um, I would like to, to, to ask the next question to Mr. Jordi Corel because he used to work for uh, uh, as, uh, as a director of European Labour Authority. Uh, and I have the question, what are the biggest challenges comes to fraud and abuses in labour mobility that the Commission and ELA is aware of? Yeah, well, first of all, I would like to um, uh, to say a couple of sentences about uh, the, the Labour Authority. I think that it was uh, it was very useful that uh, this authority was adopted by uh, created, I would say, by Parliament and by Council. And I think that the discussions on this topic were, I wouldn't say easy because nothing in Europe is easy, but was, were much more consensual than they were on other topics related to mobility. So I think that this is very important. I'm very happy as well uh, to note that the management board of the European Labour Authority has already appointed uh, a new director. So I think that this is very good news because it means that uh, all the things that are already been done by uh, by uh, by ELA will now get to uh, to uh, to, uh, to another level. So this is very useful. Now the kind. And, I mean, I like uh, discussing about uh, fraud, but I like also to discuss about the fact that uh, most of the situations are not situations of fraud. Yeah? I mean, of course, a situation of fraud is one too many situations of fraud. I'm not saying that. A situation of exploitation of, uh, of a worker is one too many situation of exploitation of a worker. No doubt about that. But the, what, what I would like to say is that the economic activity in Europe and the cross-border economic activity is not a particularly fraudulent uh, activity. We have many, many, many companies from all member states which uh, provide services across the borders in all legality, in all respect of the rules and uh, we with, uh, with a benefit for everybody, for the worker, because here she gets a slightly higher salary, for the customer, because she gets a, or she gets a, a slightly lower uh, price for the same service, for the company, uh, because it thrives and it has a bigger market, for the member states, because they collect taxes and they collect, uh, and they collect uh, social security contributions. So, I mean, all in all, uh, this mobility is good. And I would like to underline that because often those of us like uh, Magdalena and myself who are busy in this area, sometimes uh, we just speak about the problems and not about the solution. Now, what we see, uh, I guess that one of the main things that we see is uh, what we could call the letterbox companies. That is to say some uh, entrepreneurs who uh, are uh, who don't respect the rules and who create what we could call I mean we call it we call them letterbox companies because they are not real companies. They pretend that they establish themselves in a member state where they just have a letterbox uh, to get the mail, so to speak, and then they post workers from there in order to circumvent both the laws of the country where they have set the company and the laws of the country where they post their workers. And I think, but Magdalena, I'm sure that she has more experience than I do, but I think that the real problem uh, to which uh, labor inspectorates are confronted uh, are, have two, two causes. The first one is that these people who are criminals, they move faster than us. I mean, they see the loopholes in the, in, the, in the regulation faster than us and they move very quickly. And the reaction of the public authorities and in particular of the labor uh, inspectorate, of course, has to be according to law. Uh, so uh, in order to prove that a company is just a letterbox company, this takes time. In the meantime, the company has disappeared and has changed names and has installed another letterbox company to uh, two streets further, etc. So that's the first thing, that these people being criminals, they move too fast. That's the first one. The second one is that of very often, if not always, or at least when, when, when we are talking about that in, in this context of mobility, what we see is that, um, and that they do have a cross-border activity. And then it's more difficult uh, for, the labor for the national labor inspectorates to act because by definition, a national labor inspectorate uh, has jurisdiction within the member state, not the member state next to it. And that's why precisely I think that ELA is a very important thing because ELA will allow for two things, for, well, other things, but in particular for two things. First of all, to get the correct information for all of those companies and workers who want to respect the law 
which are the vast, vast, vast majority, be able, they have already, as a matter of fact, uh, in September, where we launched under ELA the first uh, concerted uh, inspection, inspection, which means that the labor inspectors of uh, Belgium, in this case, went to the construction site to verify whether, um, whether the rules were being complied by. And at the same time, since they knew that there was a large uh, Portuguese company which had posted workers to this, uh, to this construction site, at the same time, as I said, the, the Portuguese labor inspectors were uh, inspecting the company in, uh, in Portugal. This means that, uh, in this case, uh, I still don't know the results because these things, are, as I said before, take time, but it means that there was a real-time communication between the two inspectors. So we think that ELA, by providing the right information and by uh, facilitating cooperation between labor inspectors of the different member states, will bring a change uh, to the European labor market landscape. Oh, I know that you have to leave us in a few minutes, but uh, can I ask you just one question more? In front of my uh, eyes, the complaint of the uh, European Trade Union Confederation. It was published days ago, and they are writing the ELA has failed to take real action over the first cases of worker exploitation referred to it a year ago by trade union. And uh, there is the list of 10 cases involving the non payment of wages, holiday pay, sick pay, social contribution. There is the one example uh, 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 showing the difficult situation of Polish company in Denmark uh, providing uh, bricklayers. Uh, 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 the Polish company providing bricklayers has sent two, 10 workers to sites in Copenhagen. The workers have been told by the company which has been involved in other labor court cases in Poland. They, they are not allowed to speak to and so on and so on, and um, TUC is saying that uh, uh, ELA just, uh, I mean, did nothing, uh, just sent this complaint, asked the national governments to uh, look at these cases. What can you say about that? Well, I can say that uh, that I think that it's very important that ETUC, as Business Europe and as all the other uh, social partners on both sides, are heavily involved in the operation of ELA. And this is something that the Commission proposed and which was also, of course, not accepted, but endorsed uh, uh, in full uh, in full conscience, I would say, by the legislators. I think that this is fundamental. Uh, independently of what the role of social partners is in each member state, I think it's very important that at EU level they are involved. So that's my first, uh, my first thing. And I'm very happy to see that they take uh, their role very seriously and that they are there in order to remind us uh, that uh, action should be taken. Of course, ETUC knows perfectly well, and I have spoken to them, and they know it perfectly well, that the role of ELA is not to launch inspections. I mean, ELA is not there to create a supranational or European body of inspections. Uh, so, so that, and they know it perfectly well, and we have discussed it many times. So it would be impossible for ELA, luckily, to intervene in the specific cases. Now, what the regulation uh, foresees is that the trade unions can bring to the, to the attention of ELA such cases, and that there, that there has to be a procedure in order for ELA to decide how and when to transmit that to the labor inspectorate, so to, uh, in this case that you were mentioning in particular to the Polish and the Danish uh, labor inspectorate, and in order to see what action has to be taken. And this is uh, something that we have already done. I mean, uh, I would like to remind that ELA uh, is barely uh, 16, uh, 17 months old, and we are already, we have already, with the help of member states, with the help of uh, trade unions, with the help of, uh, of employees' organizations, we have already established uh, this procedure so that, uh, so that uh, these sort of complaints can be dealt with in an appropriate manner. Now, when, uh, when uh, ETUC brought to our attention these cases, uh, ELA had uh, one day of existence. Uh, and uh, there was no procedure, there, there was no people. What I did as a interim director of ELA was to send those cases to uh, my colleagues in the management board. 
to the different colleagues, to the Danish, to the Belgian, to the Polish, etc., just informing them about that. Some of them replied, and I informed duly uh, ETUC, and uh, I mean, I meet with them very regularly, so they knew perfectly well what we were doing. Some of them did not reply, so we send a reminder before the summer, and we are uh, dealing with that. But it is very difficult uh, for Ella to react in those cases, as I said, for two reasons. First of all, as ETUC knows, we are not a new body of inspection, inspectors, first thing. Second thing, uh, in order for uh, ELA to deal with these cases, we need to have an agreed procedure. And this agreed procedure, which is already uh, thought, uh, will be adopted by the management board, whereas, a matter of fact, ETUC and Business Europe sit, and it will be adopted in, in December. Which, again, taking into account uh, how difficult uh, the discussion on this point was in the Council, I think it's a, a pretty swift action, I would say. And uh, the ELA will be fully operational in 2024, am I right? No, in 2021, no, no. ELA, it's already operational, as I said. Uh, yeah, as I said, uh, we already have uh, launched uh, concerted inspections in spite of the pandemic, so it is working now. There will be a new director which will uh, take office uh, either in, uh, in December or in January at the latest, because now we know who it is. And uh, it will be fully autonomous uh, at the latest in August next year. And then, uh, of course, the first years uh, will, uh, will, I mean, we are recruiting new people and so on, but I think that they are already operational and that they will be operational, fully, fully operational very quickly. Of course, the recruitment of the, of the people for ELA and organizing all the logistics takes some time, but I would like to underline again that in spite of, in spite of the fact that it is a very young uh, body, a very young uh, authority, it has already carried out a number of, uh, of activities which are pretty, I would say, pretty impressive. Uh, Mr. Jordi Kuril Gotor, can you be with us longer or you have to leave? I have to leave, I'm sorry. I mean, if you want to watch one last question very short, but apologies because otherwise I will miss my other... I'm really sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, the, the question will be general, but if you can ans answer briefly, we'll be delighted. What is the future of mobility? Well, mobility, and I think that Madalena referred to that when, uh, when she uh, replied to the question of, on, of COVID. I mean, I think that COVID for us, for us, I mean for all of us, not for the European Commission, but for all of us, has been a wake-up call. And we have seen two things, in my view. The first thing is that without mobility, Europe doesn't work. And if Europe doesn't work, uh, member states don't work. Uh, we have seen that uh, when the borders were closed, it was an issue for every individual member state, uh, both for those who are seen more traditionally as sending uh, the, uh, their workforce abroad, but also for those uh, who, uh, who are perceived as receiving uh, workforce. It has been a bit of a disaster, eh? so that's the first thing. So mobility, luckily, is here to stay, and we have to make sure that the internal market works better and better. And mobility, if done properly, if done fairly, it's, uh, it's uh, beneficial for workers, for employers, for member states, both those who send and those who receive work. So that, that's one thing that we have seen. The other thing that we have seen, and this, this is a bit, uh, a bit more sad, is that there are situations of abuse. And we have seen that, and we have to open our eyes in front of that. I mean, we knew about, I mean, we thought we knew more or less about some situations of abuse, which again are not uh, prevalent. I'm not saying that all the situations are like that, but we knew that there were some I would say some pockets of abuse in in the EU, and uh, with the pandemics we have seen, we have seen it even better, and we have seen that there are some situations in which workers, not always posted workers, also uh, mobile workers, uh, simple mobile workers, so to speak, are exposed and are, and are vulnerable. So I think that if we combine these two uh, things that the pandemic that the pandemic has brought to the light, we will do act in consequence, which is to say we will uh, continue. Uh, to strive for achieving uh, a fair mobility in Europe, which on the one hand uh, allows 
uh, our economies to thrive and therefore they, they result in the benefit of all EU citizens, but at the same time, which is very careful in avoiding uh, abuse of workers. And this, I think that in this respect, of course, I have to say it, ELA will play a major role by bringing together and by facilitating cooperation between uh, member states. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Jordi Kurul Gautor, the thank you. Labor Mobility at DG Employment. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, you've been out with us. Thank you. Thanks to you. Uh, thank you to good luck. Well. It's All been the best. Pleasure. It was a pl thank you, uh, my pleasure. The same for you. Thank you. Bye bye. I'll see thank you soon, you. I hope. Stay safe. <laughs> Fortunately, uh, Mrs. Magdalena Sveckwe is ready to stay with us for a few minutes more. Really? So, <laughs> thank you for that. And, uh, and I'll be happy to ask you uh, uh, at least uh, two or maybe three questions which are related with the situation of Polish sectors of, of businesses and, and, uh, and with the discussion about the posting in, in, in Poland. Uh, and of course, to uh, start with the question we've got uh, 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 to, to our uh, look, is there a need for EU solutions to address the problem of highly mobile workers such as international transport drivers? This problem has been raised by trade unions for many years under the current Polish regulation, the contribution for the pension insurance of national transport driver is deducted from the minimum wage. The remaining of the remuneration is not subject uh, uh, to social security contribution. As a consequence, there will be low pensions for drivers in the future, low sickness benefits they currently receive in case of illness. Uh, uh, what, what do you say about that? Well, um, I would say that, um, first of all, it's uh, not the competence of my uh, ministry, I mean, the ministry I represent. Uh, uh, we, uh, it is the competence of Ministry of uh, Infrastructure. Um, the second thing is that it is not um, the determining of uh, constituent uh, elements and the remuneration uh, and social security system as regards different uh, specific group of workers, uh, such as international drivers, is the competence of the member states. So the Ministry of Infrastructure who proposed those uh, solution, solutions uh, um, done it without, it's not connected with the implementation of the uh, NEU uh, law. Mm, as regards, uh, mm, as I understand from the question, the need to change uh, or discussion about uh, whether it should be changed or not, um, I would like to say that um, there was a, a mobility package um, approved by the uh, at the EU level, and there are some provisions concerning uh, posting uh, of drivers. Until uh, the specific uh, provision of on the posting of drivers adopted in that mobility package are implemented, which is, if I'm not, uh, uh, if I'm sure, um, in 2022, uh, drivers are not uh, covered by the uh, latest posting. Um, uh, latest changes by uh, of posting uh, regulations and uh, directives so new solutions will be uh, developed in the ministry of uh, infrastructure and new proposals uh, how to implement the eu law in that respect so i can strongly encourage you to and our view, viewers to uh, to take part, uh, active part in the public consultation on, on the new regulation. That would be the place and the occasion on of uh, implementation um, of the mobility package to discuss um, whether um, changes in the Polish model of remuneration for drivers uh, need to be done. And I have another question uh, uh, related to, uh, to the problem raised by the Polish newspapers just recently. 
and uh, this is about uh, elderly uh, sitters. The new directive on posting workers does not apply to them. They still earn the same and have no social protection. The paper writing a lot of about the dramatic situation of the Polish ladies working especially in Germany and they are also underlining that the most Polish women are employed in Germany as a sitter not a medical carer which changed uh, a lot in the situation and again could it be something done in, in that uh, in that area in your opinion or not well, um, if um, um, those who took, take care of elderly people in, uh, in Germany or in other countries are posted workers, then the directive will apply. Um, the question is whether they are, they are posted workers or not. Um, as regards, as far as uh, I know, the, the, there are different models uh, concerning um, their presence in uh, in other countries sometimes they are posted sometimes they they are employed um, formally at least uh, by the local um, um, agency sometimes they are um, they cooperate with the agency, uh, temporary agency, or undertaking uh, on the based on the civil uh, service, um, a civil um, law um, um, contracts. The directive on on posting of workers applies to those who are employees, who are workers. Um, in the meaning of um, of the national uh, regulations of the of the host country, so of the country when when the posted worker um, performed the work with temporarily uh, within the framework of provision of services. So um, this is definitely complex situation, uh, and there are different. Uh, variation of the um, solutions and and uh, different uh, fa multi-factor driven. Um, so I think we should uh, we might have a separate dialogue concerning that uh, topic. Uh, so um, I will um, finish on that. Anyway, we are going to the end. So thank you very very much, Magdalena Sveikli at Labour Law Department, Minister of Economic Development, Labour and Technology was with us. Thank you. Thank and you very much. Uh, thank you to thank you to you uh, for I mean the citizens for all the questions. Thank you to friends from Labour Mobility Initiative Association to to gather these questions and 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 to prepare for this citizens dialogue. Uh, just uh, to the Remind our topic was the future of work mobility in the EU. Maciej Zakrocki, thank you so much and thank uh, you. Have, a, have good health and, and all the best. Same to you and all of the viewers. Uh, I hope everyone stays safe as much as possible in these bizarre times. Thank you.